For the backgrounds of my videos, I want to start including gameplay that is relevant to what I'm talking about, in some loose way. The topic of this video is death and extinction, so for this one I chose Dino Crisis 2, which is a game about killing extinct animals. When I was little, I used to get these uneasy feelings at bedtime. When I turned out the lights and got under the blankets, this fear would creep up on me. Sometimes it was only a feeling, with no specific thoughts attached. Other times it started when I thought about how I was eventually going to grow old and die. For some reason, this anxiety that I felt, no matter how intense it got, it would always disappear instantly the moment that I sat up out of bed. Of course I couldn't stay up all night, and when I got back into bed I would feel fear again. Lying on my back in a dark, silent room made me feel like I was stuck in a coffin. But I comforted myself by thinking about how I had so many years left. Now I'm 30 years old and I've lost that comfort of knowing that I have a long time left to live. Death is all I think about. I find myself picturing people and animals as corpses. My death phobia is the reason for everything I do. I watch movies to learn about death or just to distract myself from it. I take diazepam to stop the panic attacks. I do cardio and try to be healthy just to delay my death as much as possible. And I'm making this video so that something from my life will live on. I've heard people argue that death shouldn't be feared because non-existence is something that we'll never experience. Mark Twain put it like this. I do not fear death. I'd been dead for billions of years before I was born, and I had not suffered the slightest inconvenience from it. Far be it from me to criticise Mark Twain, but I don't find this argument convincing. Before we were born, we had nothing to lose. Losing everything is terrifying, and the time we spent before our lives began wasn't eternal. The billions of years from the beginning of the universe until birth, which in my case was in 1992, that may be a very long time, but it wasn't forever. Assuming there's no afterlife, the same can't be said for death. When we die, we're never coming back. I had my first panic attack at 18 when I tried too hard to comprehend an eternity of non-existence, and what that meant. Now I'm 30 and I still haven't recovered from that existential crisis. Since around 2014, until recently, my favourite YouTube channel was Gaming Garbage, a sort of ironic let's play show hosted by Rich Kayanka. In later years, gaming garbage streams became unbearably depressing, as Rich complained about chronic pain, allegations of abuse from his exes, and losing his kids. For some reason, I still watched all of his streams, even though Rich clearly wasn't funny anymore. One day when Rich was complaining about his life on stream, I left the super chat advising him to read the famous self-help book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. During his next stream, he actually made a couple of jokes that I'm pretty sure were references to the book. I doubt he read Seven Habits entirely, he probably just read the short summary on Wikipedia or something. Anyway, when he hadn't streamed for a few weeks, I decided to look him up. I learned pretty late the news of his s**t Someone I'd spent years watching every single day 
suddenly he didn't exist anymore. I can't get my head around how someone can be a conscious person one day and then not exist at all the next day. I go through this sort of panic whenever a celebrity who I care about dies. Sarah Harding from Girls Aloud was another one that hit me pretty hard. She said that because of her cancer she wouldn't live to see another Christmas, and she was right. The worst thing about death is that it's not just me but all human life has to come to an end eventually. When the world ends, the universe will be mostly dark and empty, and nobody will remember that we were here. The end of the world probably won't happen in my lifetime, but it has to happen sometime, somehow. This thought makes me panic, but it's more than just common anxiety. There aren't any physical symptoms. Instead it just feels like there's this enormous weight that's crushing my soul. And it's so intense that I don't know how to respond to it. What I'm trying to explain is best shown in my favourite movie, Melancholia. Melancholia is one of Lars von Trier's films about depression. I'm not the biggest Lars von Trier fan in general. I couldn't finish Antichrist personally. But Melancholia is his only movie that's easily accessible to anyone. Kind of like how The Straight Story stands out in the filmography of David Lynch. If you haven't seen Melancholia, I'll try not to spoil too much. Kirsten Dunst has just gotten married but the wedding party is ruined by her depression as well as the fighting within her dysfunctional family. Meanwhile, a rogue planet called Melancholia is on a collision course with Earth. The Earth is evil. We don't need to grieve for it. What? Nobody will miss it. Why would Leo grow up? All I know is life on Earth is evil. There may be life somewhere else, but there isn't. How do you know? Because I know things. Oh yes, you always imagined you did. I know we're alone. I don't think you know that at all. I was having a depressive episode when I first saw this movie. I wouldn't say it made me less depressed, but it did make me realise that I don't want to die. And that was a valuable takeaway, and reason enough for me to recommend this movie to anyone with mental health problems. My death phobia is portrayed in this movie perfectly. Melancholia is far scarier to me than any horror story. The entire second half has this unbearable tension, and the viewer never gets a break from it. I've tried to talk to friends and psychologists about my death phobia, but it's hard to put into words. I feel like Charlotte Gainsbourg's character Claire when she's panicking about melancholia as it gets closer to Earth, and Kiefer Sutherland's character is trying to comfort her. I'm afraid of that stupid planet. That stupid planet? That wonderful planet, you mean? It will be here in five days, and it is not going to hit us. Claire, look at me. Sweetheart, you have to trust the scientists. They say that it will hit. No, they don't. That's not true. Not the real scientists. Not the prophets of doom. They'll write whatever they can to attract attention. But the real scientists, all of them agree. Melancholia is just going to pass right in front of us. 
And it's gonna be the most beautiful sight ever. I think about this movie every day, every time I happen to look at the sky. If you're not convinced to watch it, maybe artsy movies are not your thing, then just think of Alec Guinness in Star Wars. A million voices cried out in terror and then were silenced. One of the earliest memories I have of my grandmother, I don't know how little I was, she pointed at the night sky and she told me about the man on the moon. I couldn't see how the craters formed the shape of a person, but I took her word for it. I didn't need to see it for myself to appreciate what she was telling me. Another time I remember she was babysitting me and she taught me how to play I Spy. For some reason, I thought the word beginning meant ending. So, when I said something beginning with, I kept referring to the last letter of a word instead of the first. I still remember how much I confused her that day. Now that my grandmother has become senile, these memories are precious. My dad and I, we visit her in the rest home and, until recently, she was always happy to see us, even though she was confused and would struggle to finish the sentence. She told me how lucky she felt to live all the way to 90. She talked about her memory problems in such an accepting way, like aging is just another part of life. Her experience didn't look anything like Anthony Hopkins' character in The Father, my nana's skills in stoicism and positive thinking is something that I don't have, and I wish I could learn how she did it. Back in January, my dad and I visited her as usual, but this time it was strange. My nana immediately started the conversation by saying, A nurse told me last night that I had died. But then the nurse said to go to sleep and we'll see how you are in the morning. My nana went on to ask, what's the difference between being alive and being dead? She wasn't being philosophical or rhetorical. This was a real question. She asked in the same tone that she might ask, what time is it? Or anything else. I might have misunderstood her, but I got the sense that she was trying to ask, how will she know when she's not alive anymore? I didn't know what to say, so my dad just explained that, you know, the heart stops, your brain can't get oxygen anymore, and then you die. And this answer seemed to satisfy her. We reassured her that she's alive, but honestly, she didn't seem worried about death, only curious about it. The rest home she resided in at the time was shutting down, so we explained that we'd be moving her into a new home. My dad referred to this new rest home as a better place. He obviously meant this in the literal sense, but for a moment I worried about the choice of words. Exactly at the moment when I had that worry, my nana responded by saying that funerals are very expensive. We assured her that we were not arranging her funeral. On the other side of the room, a music player was set up, and it was playing this nice, calming music that made me think about that scene in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. It must have been playing from a CD, because the music started skipping. Hearing the nice music fail to play reminded me of Everywhere at the End of Time. If you haven't heard of this, it's a very famous concept album. It depicts the demented mind as old-timey music that gradually turns into harsh noise.
Then this cute nurse came in to fix the problem and this old man went up to her and asked for sex. The nurse kindly said she was too busy. So then this guy just went back to what he was doing before, which was repeatedly flipping the light switch on and off and pulling the curtains back and forth. So at this point I noticed that I was starting to feel sick in my gut, like I needed to vomit. This is something that happens when I think too much about death. It's a symptom of anxiety. Anyway, it turned out this was the last time that a visit from me and my dad would mean anything to my nana. It happened much quicker than I expected. Dementia swiftly took the rest of her mind away, and now she's gone. She's alive, but she's gone in every way that matters. My nana's condition has given me this thought. What if I'm in the same situation myself? What if I'm in the later stages of dementia and my brain is just replaying a memory as I'm stuck in bed in some rest home? The year isn't 2022 like I think it is. It's closer to 2070 and I'm just a dying old man. Or maybe I'm lying unconscious on the road somewhere after being struck by a car. What if I'm going through a near-death experience right now? If I can successfully upload this video to YouTube and you at home can watch it, then I'm not going through dementia right now, or an NDE. And I hope that's the case, because the idea of being doomed is terrifying. But that is also reality. Like the planet heading towards Earth in melancholia, death is coming for all of us, and there's not a thing we can do to stop it. But I feel alone in my panic. I don't understand how anyone can make it through a whole day without diving into existential dread knowing that we're stuck in this nightmare world where nothing is permanent, time can only move forward, and all life has to end. 